Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to this session. I'm sure you are all excited as well. We've been ch chatting about this session in our emails, in our WhatsApp group, and here's the session that we're looking forward for. Uh, the discussion that we have uh, with Mr. Eric Solheim, and it's such an honor uh, and a privilege that we have him join uh, us and spend some time with uh, with our future leaders on some of the projects that you're creating. So I'm sure you'll get an opportunity to discuss that. Uh, but first, um, Eric uh, would like to welcome you and express uh, you know, our, our gratitude for accepting our invitation and for sparing your valuable time with us uh, in the next uh, 90 minutes. I'm sure we all as future leaders and the organizers of uh, One Million for One Million, we all are looking forward, so welcome. So we'd like to give a round of applause for you. I, I wish this was in person, but yeah, we'll do the virtual claps. The so camera, I go to, you. to give you a brief uh, overview, Eric, and before I introduce you uh, to, to all the future leaders that we have here, uh, Eric, this is an organization uh, called One Million for One Billion, uh, which we started five years back, basically as a movement of youth and uh, the dream is that, uh, you know, why can't we mobilize a million young people who can impact a billion people and create a sustainable planet? And uh, we all have this conversation that one day the government will do us and we keep on complaining uh, that somebody somewhere, maybe a corporate sector, maybe the United Nations, maybe the government should be sort of helping and creating a sustainable world. But the vision of this organization and all the people that you're meeting today is that we won't complain, let's partner with the large organizations, partner with the governments, the multilaterals, uh, the bilaterals, and really help in achieving the sustainable development goals and really create a planet which is safer, healthier for everyone. So with that, we started and uh, you know, we run this program called the Future Leaders uh, in, in India schools. And we, these are basically high school, and senior school students who have undergone a rigorous curriculum on leadership and entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial thinking to, to really identify what they are passionate about, what is their higher purpose. And after we have done that through a, a rigorous curriculum, they are required to create a project which is kind of a manifestation of their higher purpose or the purpose or the passion. So with that, they've created wonderful projects, uh, you know, uh, we host this wonderful summit at the United Nations annually, where uh, some of these young people, uh, they come and also uh, uh, talk at the United Nations headquarters and we have wonderful people and the United Nations has been a big support. So, uh, so some of them really get an opportunity to present at the top uh, to people like you. And uh, during the pandemic, we thought we'd take this opportunity that we can't travel now to the United Nations till it's safe and uh, all of them are young people. So we just want to make sure that we have uh, thought leaders like you join them and join us and, uh, and inspire these young people. And also we go through some of your career journeys, your life lessons, uh, and uh, how you manage that, how you really do what you're doing. You have a remarkable career. So that's what this whole session is all about. But all these students that you're going to be meeting today, and some of them will be presenting, unfortunately, because of lack of time, we only have four presentations. But there are over 75 students who, are, uh, who have qualified for the United Nations. Uh, whenever we have that annual summit, we'll plan that, maybe next year now. But some of them would be presenting their work and you'll get a sense of idea on what these young leaders are doing. But in short, I can, I can speak on their behalf. They're all bold and uh, they're talking and doing both and not just talking. And, uh, and they're creating a real impact in their, in their backyard or in their community. And uh, have taken really bold challenges and have worked even during the pandemic, even in the, during the lockdown, they have created wonderful projects and you know, I'll, I'll let them talk about it. So, um, so as, we, as we do that, uh, let me switch gears to the future leaders. Well, uh, all of you, uh, this is a great opportunity for you. Let me introduce Eric to you. Uh, now, uh, Eric has, has a very illustrious career. He's a well-known global leader on environment and is an experienced peace negotiator. 
Now, something for you to ask Eric, what he does on the peace negotiation, because Eric, I'm very fascinated on how did you do that? And I've been reading your interviews, I've been hearing about uh, your, uh, your, you know, your thoughts on this, but definitely a lot of questions on that. But he's a Norwegian diplomat. He's joining us from Oslo today. Uh, he's a former politician uh, from, he was in office from 2005 to 12. He was the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Director of the United Nations Environmental Program from 2016 to 18. And now he's the CEO of Plastic Revolution Foundation, something that uh, we definitely have more questions, Eric, from on you on what you've been doing there and what's your vision. But you've been really out there leading the discussion on climate and the climate deal and how the multipolar world can come together on a common platform and how technology innovation can really fuel climate. So we've been hearing a lot about it, but, uh, but we thought that we'll ask those questions. But at this point of time, uh, we'd like you uh, like to welcome on all, all our future leaders and on the team of 1M1B to, to this exciting evening that we have today with you. So welcome. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'm really excited to speak. Uh, to this brilliant group of young leaders and also to listen uh, to your, their voices. So thank you, thank you so much for inviting me. Great, thank you, Eric. Uh, so we'll start with um, Eric, uh, some opening remarks. Let's, we'd like to hear from you, um, what you would like to share, anything about your career, your work, what you do, and how did you really get passionate about climate? Th th thank you so much. And let, let me share some thoughts on climate and how young people can take a lead uh, on finding the solutions to the climate problem and how India uh, can lead the world on this issue. Very often I get the question from people, I mean, does it matter what I do? Can I really as a young person uh, change the world? And yes, who else? No one else will change the world for you. Uh, the young people have been in the forefront on nearly any change which has happened in history. Let me give you just one example. In, when we had the biggest of all environment conferences in the UN, that was in 1992, in Brazil, in uh, Rio de Janeiro, there was a young person there. Her name was Severn Suzuki. She was 12 years at the time, and she made a brilliant speech to the leaders in, in Rio, really telling them to behave better and to take better care of Mother Earth. And I put this out on social media, and then a lot of people said, oh no, it shows that nothing works. Because she spoke up to lead this in 1992, uh, and we are, same, we are in the same mess, so it didn't matter. But then I had to tell people, no, it mattered a lot because the two issues she brought up at the time, they're both resolved. Uh, she didn't speak about climate because climate was not a big environment issue back in 1992. She spoke about the hole in the ozone layer, which is protecting humans against very dangerous radioactive uh, radiation. And she spoke about uh, acid rain. No one is really concerned with these two issues any longer because the hole in the ozone layer is healed. It will come back. And by 2050, uh, it will be back in the same uh, circumstances as it was before we humans started to, uh, to uh, uh, destroy it by our, by our emissions. And acid rain in most of the world is also a thing of the past, that this is a much, much smaller problem uh, that, than, than it was. So it shows exactly the opposite. It matters. Uh, and if we look to how these issues vary, so why, why did we manage to solve the hole in the ozone layer? I think it was, was three forces. These three forces are the same today. One, public opinion. Young people and others speaking up, telling leaders that you need to change. You cannot continue on this, this wrong path. We need to bring everyone into, out of poverty into a, a good life, and we need to protect Mother Earth. And the power of young people speaking up, manifestations, speaking up to leaders, um, uh, writing in newspapers, putting out messages on social media, it can never be underestimated. Secondly, you need brave political leaders. Uh, that happened at that time when we solved the problem of the ozone layer, but it, it, it's the same today. Uh, Prime Minister Modi of India made a huge number of good global initiatives uh, for the environment is, for instance, the, has started the International Solar Alliance to provide solar energy to the world. 
And yesterday, the president of China, one of the most powerful persons in the world, promised that China will now be uh, carbon neutral by 2060. That's a new, very important promise. And if you move to the European Union, the European Union has embarked upon what they call a Green New Deal. Uh, so political leaders are taking the challenge, but they would not have done it if it had not been for the pressure from people at the grassroots level. And thirdly, business. Uh, only business can find uh, solutions scalable and big enough to solve the problem. But now business all over the planet are basically ahead of political leaders. Look to the United States where the president is not a climate uh, advocate, but all major businesses are. All the big tech companies, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, uh, all of them, uh, have made, uh, Facebook, they have all made very important climate promises. Microsoft, for instance, has promised not only to be carbon uh, ne uh, neutral, they have promised to compensate for all emissions in the history of Microsoft. That's much braver than any government or any, any state in the world. It's a huge promise. And Microsoft also promised just recently that by 2030, there will be a zero waste company, meaning that no plastic waste uh, will come uh, from Microsoft. So business is playing a very key role, but it's of course pushed by the public opinion and by young people. If you look to the world now, and particularly to India, there is so much exciting happening and we just need to do more of it and replicate it. Look to energy. The first all solar airport in the world is in Kochi uh, in Kerala. Uh, it's, it's remarkable, how, how can you run an entire airport by solar energy? But the guys there have shown that you can do that. Uh, they even can grow the vegetables under the solar, solar panels so that the staff of the airport uh, can, can benefit. And mind you, this is the fourth biggest international airport in India, which is not a small place. Uh, and they were the first in the world. In Assam, they have made the first all uh, solar rail station in the world. And solar energy is now taking off all over India. Madhya Pradesh may be the key state for solar, but Tamil Nadu, uh, Karnataka, there are huge solar plants basically everywhere. And a lot more will come because for the first time in human history, the price of solar is lower than the price of coal. So not only you do good for the environment by moving to solar, but you save money. You have more money to spend on education and health if you move to solar. So we see not any longer any, any discussion about whether you want to develop or want to uh, take care of Mother Earth. Yes, thank you, both. We do economy and ecology with the same policies. On transport, we have to admit that China is in the lead. I mean, the Ch southern Chinese city of Shenzhen have 18,000 electric buses. Uh, nearly all electric buses in the entire world are currently in China. Uh, but now China, India is also stepping up. I mean, a huge number of big um, uh, Chinese, uh, sorry, Indian cities, Mumbai, Ahmedabad, Delhi, Kolkata, for sure many others, have promised to move fast into electric buses. And that will, of course, reduce the local pollution in the cities, uh, but it's also good uh, for, for the climate. And we also see um, the, the states in India and the government making policies for electric cars so that people can move into electric vehicles and electric three-wheelers and simply electrify society. And through that, you do good for health, you do good for environment, and you do good for jobs and, and the economy. So it's, it's a triple win policy. Agriculture, uh, Southern Indian state of Andhra Pradesh is in the lead with its zero, zero uh, waste or zero emissions uh, agriculture programs, which are remarkable. Farmers get more yield, but much less emissions. Again, good for health, good for the economy, uh, good for everyone, win-win policies. And finally, we need to protect nature much better. Uh, here also, uh, there are remarkable examples from all corners of the world. I mean, the Chinese are doing much better on the pandas. Small Latin American state of Costa Rica has doubled its tree cover. Uh, so there are remarkable examples. But in India, we see uh, uh, bypasses um, built of roads and railroads so that elephants and other animals are not um, destroyed. 
It's very good, good uh, news. And the number of tigers in India and Nepal and basically all everywhere is increasing for the first time. The number of tigers were decreasing year by year by year. But now Nepal has doubled the number of tigers. And also in India is increasing rather than decreasing because India is linked national parks so that are uh, ha habitats for tigers. So on all areas which really matters, energy, transport, agriculture and nature, we see a lot of positives. So what young people in India need to do is to speak about all this fantastic progress and of course tell leaders in business and politics, please do more of this. It works and we will create jobs, improve the health. Uh, many Indian cities are very polluted. We, will, we need to breathe uh, better uh, and we take care of Mother Earth and the climate at the same time. Finally, um, if you are looking for uh, some remarkable leader you should follow, you should look to the biggest of all, or greatest of all, all Indians, maybe the greatest human being ever walking on planet Earth, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And you can always ask yourself, what would the Mahatma have done uh, if he had been living today? And for sure, he always wanted to protect all groups, all people, particularly protect poor people and at the same time protect Mother Earth. Gandhi said that uh, we have more than enough for everyone's needs. We don't have enough for everyone's greed. And he said, you need to be, uh, the, you need to live the way you want the world to be. You need to be a, a living example uh, for the world, you, how we want to see the future. So uh, I'm listen, uh, looking forward to listening to you. But I'm excited and inspired by this, uh, this great initiative. And I'm very, very confident that India will be a lead nation in the 21st century, uh, really taking care of Mother Earth and moving towards a much, much greener future. And for that to happen, young people in India need to take the lead. Thank you so much, Eric, for, for inspiring words and uh, giving us the context uh, on why this is such a big deal. In fact, uh, you know, uh, we'll be launching the Climate Action Clubs uh, later in the, in the hour. And uh, what uh, we are trying to do is basically go to all the high schools and start a climate action initiative so that many young people could be part of it. And of course, we are also doing work on artificial intelligence AI and using AI and innovation. And I also do some work with University of California, Berkeley. So we're trying to get everybody together in India so that uh, you know we can come up with innovations and bold actions which which can support uh, climate action into the world but uh, eric as we as we go forward later in that session where which we, where we talk about that we want to really start um, with your career and uh, your childhood or your early days so uh, how was you how were you as a teenager like what were you doing when with you know when you were 16 and how did you get inspired and what trajectory did you follow? What education did you have? I mean, so many questions we have, uh, which would be very useful for uh, all the teenagers here. The, I was at an early age engaged with politics because I felt we need to protect uh, the, the, the planet. We need to do much, much better than we do. Uh, I was appalled by seeing the poverty of the world. We cannot live uh, with, with that. And the main event when I was a teenager in the world was the war in Vietnam. Because that was one of probably the most meaningless uh, war in human history. Three million people were killed. And the result of the war was exactly what it would have been without a war. Without a war, the Vietnamese uh, communists or nationalists would have won. With the war, they also won. So why, why waste three million uh, young, young and some also only lives for that, we were protesting against that war and ultimately the Americans uh, and ended the war to the great benefit of the people of, of Vietnam and, and, and uh, for sure the people of America also. Great, uh, and uh, uh, how did you enter politics and what age did you enter your, uh, your political careers? How did that all start? I entered the youth union of, the, of my party at the time and uh, we, there were many issues, but I was, all, all the time, particularly engaged with, with the environment. Uh, the environment issues have changed, uh, but uh, my, my interest in the environment has remained the same. And maybe that was inspired because 
when I was a when I was a child, we spent all our holidays up in the Norwegian mountains. My father is from a rural community there, and while I grew up in the city of Oslo, but we for all holidays we went up there, and uh, we were walking around with the cows and the sheep <laughs> there, and sometimes you could see a moose or a uh, or a fox, and we could do some fishing. Fish is very very tiny <laughs> because the, the water quality uh, is not is not like very rich fisheries. But at least we can enjoy uh, the beauty of, of, uh, of nature. Of course, I love the beauty of Norway, uh, but everywhere in the world is fantastic beauty and hardly any place in the world is as beautiful as India. I look to the Himalayas or to the Ghats or to the paddy fields or Tamil Nadu or to the deserts of Rajasthan, whatever place you look in India is also a fantastic, uh, beautiful place. And, and Eric, Norway has really been a, a global leader and has been engaged in this discussion on environment for a long, long time. Um, you know, so uh, it's very, you know, then the Scandinavian countries, right? I mean, it's very inspiring to see what Norway and the Scandinavian countries have done over the last few years and, of course, taken a global leadership role in that. Uh, how did that happen? How did these countries realize that this is something that we as a planet need to worry about and how did the leadership of the country reciprocate and come together on this? I have come to the conclusion that leadership is by far the most important issue everywhere in the world. I mean, if uh, India had not been blessed with Mahatma Gandhi, for sure it will still have been liberated from the Brits, I mean, no doubt, but it may have happened in a much more violent, much more brutal uh, way than it happened with Gandhi and it much, could have taken much, much longer than it did take with such a brilliant leader. If you look around the world now with the COVID-19 virus, some countries are doing fantastically well. Uh, they, I mean, Vietnam, as I mentioned, they have 35 deaths, which is with 110 million people, which is close to nothing. The United States have 200,000 deaths with a little bit bigger population. So leadership is a, is a key matter. And uh, Scandinavian countries have shown some ability to lead. I think the biggest success of Norwegian global environment efforts is the pro program to protect the rainforest of the world, where Norway joined forces with nations like Brazil, Indonesia, Guyana, uh, Ecuador, Colombia, and others to protect the rainforest. And as you may know, the rainforest is the, maybe the most important of all ecosystems because it's so rich on, on trees and carbon and also animal life. Yeah. And uh, Eric, I was hearing an interview of you where, uh, you know, uh, that was nine years back, of course, where you were talking about giving, uh, you know, uh, uh, assistance uh, to Indonesia billion dollars on saving the rainforest. And then you were talking about Brazil being a real leader in saving the rainforest and 75% of the rainforest were recovered. Uh, can you just tell us briefly about these experiences that you had at the United Nations and in dealing with these countries? No, they, I mean, Indonesia and Brazil are the two biggest rainforest nations in the world. Uh, until recently, Brazil did very, very well. Unfortunately, under the present leader, there is an increase in deforestation in Brazil. And until recently, they re reduced deforestation in Brazil with 80%, which is a fantastic positive achievement. Uh, and uh, Indonesia is now stepping up. And they have made all the right laws in Indonesia. <laughs> not, not the, I mean, not even the strongest environment activist from a non-government organization can find anything wrong with the laws in Indonesia. Still, they may not always be implemented, uh, but there is a huge, huge progress. And one very positive factor is also that business. I mean, all the main companies are also stepping up because they don't see their interest in destroying the planet any longer. Uh, but they see they want to have sustainable sustainable business to provide provide for jobs. So I think this program has been very successful, but it's a long way to go. Yeah, and and uh, Eric, you you uh, put in a lot of effort during your time at the United Nations for uh, getting all the countries come together on a climate deal. And I was hearing your views on how we can get together on climate to in, in a multipolar environment. Um, how How is that progressing and what has happened in that area? Uh, do you think we are uh, still in a good state where everybody is coming together? Is there roadblocks that needs to be solved? Is there something that young people can do? Uh, just curious to hear your views. Yeah, I mean, every nation in the world is, of course, important for the uh, environment, but four entities are more important than others. Those four are the United States, Europe, China, and India. 
I mean, China and India alone is uh, 37% of humanity, and for sure the two nations with by far the uh, biggest economic growth, while of course United States and Europe are the most advanced industrial economies. These four need to work together. Um, they need to bring the rest on board. And at the moment, there is huge environment progress in Europe, in China, and in India, while of course the President of the United States is not leading us on, on the environment. But if Joe Biden is elected uh, in uh, November, that will change. The United States will join uh, the global uh, um, work on, 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 on climate. And as it stands, business is taking the lead in the US and also states. And the state of California, for instance, is a very, very advanced state doing a lot of positive uh, on the environment. And as I said, so are the big companies. And this was a huge shift in business. Two weeks back, Exxon, which is the biggest oil company in the world, was thrown out of the Dow Jones <laughs> stock exchange and they put in a company called Salesforce from San Francisco. Why was that? Well, the value of oil has fallen so dramatically that Exxon is not big enough any longer because tech has taken over. The big tech companies are dominating the world. The old fashioned oil companies are not of great interest any longer, which will provide for a much better world. But to back to your question, uh, we need to work together and don't listen to all those to blame someone else. There are a number of Indians who blame China, forget it. There are a number of Chinese who blame the United States, forget it. There are Americans who want to blame both China and India, again, forget it. We need, we need to build upon what we can do together. That's great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so as we continue this conversation, I want to just hand it over to some of the students who will presenting their work on what they are doing on climate action and probably you can offer them some advice and guidance. And then we'll have an open question answer session where students will ask you a few questions uh, and we'll open that up. So uh, Safin, over to you, if you can just uh, have students presentation. Sure, Thank you sure, for, uh, for giving us your views on, on all those things and so inviting to, to hear what your response has been. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Manav. Uh, it, it's Eric, wonderful having you uh, with us today for the launch of the clubs and also to interact with the future leaders. And in, indeed, it's, it's a great honor for all the students to be attending the session and presenting to you. Um, as Manav mentioned in the beginning, um, the Future Leaders is our flagship program of one one where uh, we help students in high school. When we say high school, you know, 13 to 16 year olds actually identify their passion, the projects that they want to work on and, and look at uh, using the passion to work on different challenges and causes that really call them, you know, tying them up to the United Nations SDGs. And um, we have over 75 students who have been part of the program, uh, especially in the last few months. Um, and I have to share this interesting scorecard with you. This is our impact uh, during the COVID times. The students started off with their projects and then the lockdown started in India and the whole world was under lockdown because of the COVID pandemic. And uh, we were all, you know, wondering what can these students do in these difficult times. And, you know, this is just a short overview of what they have been able to achieve in the last uh, four to five months, all at, while sitting at home, uh, giving a new, you know, meaning to the complete word called leading from home. You know, well, there's this misconception that um, the youngsters today spend their time all the time on uh, social media, on devices, uh, maybe watching, you know, a, a series online. Uh, these students are, I think, kind of disproving that. Um, 15,000 plus people impacted, uh, 240 women getting jobs, almost 25 lakh, you know, Indian rupees raised as funds, uh, 2,000 plus women impacted. So I think, I think, you know, for a 14 year old, this is indeed a great impact. And uh, unfortunately, because of the time constraints, we can't have all the students present. So we've identified about four of the really good projects uh, which come under the climate action uh, you know, uh, sector to present to you. And uh, I'll just hand over to the students now to do all the talking. Um, first we have, in fact, is uh, Dia, who's going to present on a very interesting project on plastic. And uh, Dia, one second, let me just give you the option to unmute. Yes, Dia, you can unmute now and talk. So, so good, good evening, evening everyone. everyone. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Dia. Dia. Um, I'm sorry, there's a little bit of an echo. So, uh, is it fine now? I yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wait, wait, actually, no, it's still. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, everyone else can be uh, muted, please. Um, yeah, I think you just can continue. No, no problem. I think we can hear properly. 
Okay, then I'll continue. So good evening, everyone. I am Dia Suhas, a 16-year-old from NAFL, Bangalore. I'm here to talk about Why Plastic, a project working on reducing plastic consumption by bringing small, sustainable changes to the community. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. Every year, 5 trillion plastic bags are produced. Every second, 160,000 are used. And it never goes away. Plastic doesn't biodegrade. It just breaks down to tinier and tinier toxic bits of itself. So if it doesn't decompose, where does it all end up? Mostly into the oceans, causing upwards of a million marine animals to die painful deaths every year. And why? Because it's more convenient for us to keep using plastic. But it's not just these animals we're putting in harm's way. 83% of bottled water samples have microplastics in them. We let ourselves think that plastic is okay, that it gets recycled. But only 9% of plastic generated is actually recycled. So clearly, recycling and continuing to use plastic is not a sustainable long-term solution. The best thing to do would be to stop using plastic altogether. And this is where Why Plastic comes in. Why Plastic is a project working on reducing plastic consumption by bringing small, sustainable changes to the community. We started off trying to tackle the problem of single-use plastic bags. We saw that even though um, they were banned, people still continued to use them. And after interviewing a few shopkeepers who still distributed these bags to their customers, we saw the issue lay with the price of the plastic bags. The low-income shopkeepers catered to low-income consumers and thus could not afford to switch to eco-friendly alternatives without losing customers. So we decided to try out crowdfunding to subsidize the prices of the bags. We raised 80,000 rupees from 64 donors and were able to subsidize the prices of 200 kgs of bags. To make the project more self-sustaining in the long run, we connected the shopkeepers directly with the manufacturers of the compostable bags and began to provide compostable garbage bags to households as well, using the profits to subsidize the prices of the bags for the low-income shopkeepers. And in order to spread our message, we also conducted sessions in government schools. We found that these children had close to no information on in plastic. So we facilitated a session wherein they came up with ways to reduce plastic consumption according to their socioeconomic strata, and also gave them a pamphlet in the local language Kannada. Much to our surprise, this was received with great enthusiasm, with the children constantly up updating us and the number of people they reached out to and talked to, talk to about the issue. We were even able to get the word out farther when given the opportunity to present our project on the panel at the 1M1B Activate Impact Summit at the UN in 2019. More recently, Why Plastic has also launched Falahara, a sustainable menstruation campaign to promote the use of zero waste alternatives to traditional menstrual products like pads and tampons. We are working towards reducing the menstrual waste that ends up in landfills, protecting the health of sanitation workers, animals, and the women too. We plan to conduct awareness sessions on sustainable menstrual products in school, as well as provide means of sustainable menstruation to students in low income and government schools. So far, we have been able to reduce a thousand kgs of plastic from being consumed and impacted a total of 1,500 people. We've had three community sessions spanning 50 plus households impacted 216 over the shops were provided subsidized alternatives to plastic and went plastic free we've reached out to more than 400 women through falahara our sustainable menstruation campaign thank you for listening and for this wonderful opportunity one m one b mr eric we We would love to partner with Plastic Revolution. Why Plastic to a Globe and Twitter to learn more about what we do. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dia. That's a really inspiring project and cause that you're working on. And uh, kudos to you for the incredible amount of plastic reduced from uh, the streets, from the store shops of Bangalore. Um, moving on. 
the second project is again a very interesting one, uh, quite different from plastic. Uh, this one is from uh, Kirtana. Kirtana, Hi, over to you. Yes. Okay. Hi. 33 million years ago, the planet didn't really look like what it does today. For one, it was so warm that palm trees are believed to have grown around the polar regions. Of course, today it is much, much cooler. Hi, my name is Kirtana and my project in Conscious Book is on SDG 13, Climate Change. Could you move to the next slide, please? We know we are destroying the environment, but there is a lot being done in this area today. Solutions that exist in this field are of two types, renewables and carbon absorption. Renewable technology has reduced the amount of carbon we emit. For example, we have cars with reduced carbon technology, but they still do emit some carbon. Carbon absorption focuses on absorbing carbon already released, and my project is in this area. Could you move to the next slide, please? Carbon sequestration is recapturing that excess carbon we have released. It's an emerging means to try and mitigate climate change. There are organizations who are doing a lot in, a lot in the field of carbon recapture, such as Hypergiant in the US, Carbfix in Iceland, and Norwegian Petroleum. In fact, Norwegian, but Norway is the leading country in Europe addressing carbon recapture. My project focuses on blue carbon sequestration in an urban Indian environment. This is the carbon absorbed and stored by aquatic ecosystems. Why am I not looking at using trees? Simply because although planting trees is extremely important, research shows that aquatic ecosystems absorb far, far more carbon. A very small amount of algae can absorb the same amount of carbon as a couple of acres of fully grown trees. Additionally, algae also has various uses, ranging from nutritious food to biofuel. Storing carbon dioxide via algae is also a lot safer than methods used by direct mechanized carbon capture and storage. Hence, I'm currently looking at an algae-based solution. My project has a two-pronged approach, experimentation and social awareness. For awareness, I've got blogs, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. I've connected with researchers from forest and oceanic institutes. One striking point is that India alone has hundreds of studies, yet very little action. We're still the third highest carbon emitters. I'm experimenting with an algae called spirulina to measure its viability and carbon sequestration in a city. Could you move to the next slide, please? Till now, my biggest challenge was sourcing the algae culture. However, thanks to CFTRI Mysore, I've finally started my experiment. Dr. Suresh Kumar, an algae expert, has been very kindly guiding me with my research and experiment. Could you move to the next slide, please? In terms of future plans for the next six months, it's growing my algae culture and on-ground propagation beyond social media. I hope to bring experimentation to volunteers from about 10 schools soon. After that, I hope to bring culture development and a solution to community level. My utopia is Bangalore City with special blue carbon sequestration zones located in and around high pollution areas to capture the carbon that we emit. It could be in corporate houses, our homes, and in high traffic zones. Lastly, Mr. Eric, it would be lovely if you could connect me to academicians in Norway working in the field of carbon recapture. There are so many com companies working in this field in Norway. I'm sure there's also a lot of ongoing research in this field. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirtana. And again, uh, a really uh, innovative project in looking at carbon sequestration and trying out growing your own algae. Thank you for sharing that. Next, we have an interesting project on water from uh, Rishabh. Good evening. My name is Rishabh Prashok, and today I'm going to talk about my 1M1B Future Leaders project, Mission Jal. Most of us have heard about Cape Town's Day Zero. But what do I mean by day zero? Day zero is a phenomenon in which all the taps of the city have ran dry because of no groundwater. Moving on. Let us look at the, water, the breakup of water on Earth. Even though 71% of the Earth is covered with water, only 0.01% of this water is in its pure form. And this 0.01% of water is needed to quench the thirst of a growing population of 7.9 billion people. India too is no stranger to the water crisis. 21 Indian cities are expected to reach zero groundwater levels by 2021. Shimla and Bangalore are next in line for the day zero of water. There are many ways of saving water, but I chose aerators. 
Aerators are water saving fixtures placed in tubs. They do not reduce the performance of the tubs. The water conserved by the aerator ranges from 50% all the way up to 95%. The impact I have created. At first, I had approached only my housing society, which included 15 households, and seeing the impact which I had created, that is saving 2,044,000 liters of water, I thought I had to expand my project. And I expanded it first to my school, that is NAFL, and where I saved 1,064,000 liters of water. And then to NPS Rajaji Nakar, where I saved 2,128,000 litres of water. And finally, to the world's largest hotel chain, Marriott. Two hotels of the Marriott hotel chain have adopted my project and I am saving 5,040,000 litres of water. The total water savings would amount to 10,276,000 litres of water per annum. The aim of my project was to save 10 million litres of water last year. This is me in action at NAFL, in my housing society, in NPS Rajaji Nagar, and Marriott. I spoke at the UN at the 5th 1M1B Summit in 2019. I represented SDG number 6 and called upon all global leaders and youth to save water. If I, a 14-year-old, can save so much water, just imagine how much water the youth across the world could save. Forward action. I would like to save 50 million liters of water this year. The places where I intend to implement my project include a corporate, a hotel chain, and a shopping mall, as well as a multiplex. These are my social media handles where I am advocating for water conservation and water sustainability. Please do reach out to me for more information on my project. Let us save the licks of life. Life depends on water and the reservoir depends on you. One last thing. I would like to ask Mr. Eric to help me reach out to more youth across the world so that water can be globally conserved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rishab, and uh, excellent efforts, you know, conserving 10 million liters of water. I mean, that's that's not me, any mean number. You know, even adults, we kind of wonder how can we conserve water, and here you are, uh, a 14-year-old conserving 10 million liters of water. Excellent job. Thank you for sharing this with us. And finally, the fourth project we have uh, from, two uh, from two enthusiastic girls, uh, Nishta and Mayuki, on uh, sustainable fashion. Hi, can you hear us? Yes. Hi, I'm Mayuki and she's my friend Nishtha and we are one on one We Future Leaders. We're 14 year olds from NPS Koramanga. We started this initiative, Endelebu, Fashion for the Future. Endelebu means sustainable in Swahili. With this initiative, we aim to encourage sustainable fashion habits among users of different age groups across India. Next slide. So we've all been to McDonald's or KFC at least once in our lives, even though we know how much it harms our body. The same way in the fashion industry, we have fast fashion. We too were victims of fast fashion. One day, Mayuki and I had gone for a party and I saw Mayuki wearing an outfit she'd worn one week ago. And I told her that. And she replied, oh my God, how did I repeat my outfit? We realized that so many people are going through this. We researched more about how the fashion industry harms the environment. And we saw such horrifying facts like, it takes 2,700 liters of water just to make one t-shirt. Every second, the equivalent of one garbage truck of textiles is landfilled or burned. 80 billion garments are produced every single year. Shocking, right? So what is sustainable fashion? It's the widespread reaction to fast fashion. To understand it better, we have divided it into the three R's. Reduce, reuse, and repurpose. Under reduce, we focus on buying less and buying good quality clothes so that they last longer. Under reuse, it's basically to increase the lifespan of the clothes so you can wear them more number of times by using high quality sustainable materials. It aims to follow the 30 wears test where each piece of clothing is at least worn 30 times. Under repurpose, 
is to change the purpose of clothes by either DIYing them or donating them or by just wearing them more number of times. And through this, we can lead to a system of greater ecological integrity and social justice. So here's the impact we've made till now. We first started off by repurposing clothes. We repurposed 50 pairs of clothes to make 1,200 masks. We donated 500 of these masks to an NGO, an old age home, and to migrant workers. We have conserved 135,000 liters of water by repurposing these clothes. Then we shifted to awareness. We have held three awareness sessions on how the fashion industry harms the environment and encouraging the three R's. We now have 98 active Endelevu supporters and we aim for 1,500. By Endelevu supporters, we mean people who are ready to take sustainable fashion in their lives step by step. In the future, we also want to start various unique challenges on our social media platform so people can implement um, sustainable fashion in a fun way. We also want to open our very own thrift store in Bangalore. So look at me now. I haven't bought any clothes in the past 10 months. We can proudly say that sustainable fashion is the only fashion for the future. It would be great if you can follow us on our social media handles. Mr. Eric, it would be amazing if you could also help us in finding volunteers who could make Endelevu Global. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Nishta and Mikey. That was indeed a, a very enthusiastic presentation. And, you know, all of us would look forward to uh, implementing sustainable fashion in our lives. Um, Mr. Eric, any, any uh, comments you would like to share looking at the projects that the students have presented? Um, I, I think you're muted. No, I, I'm yes. so inspired because all, all these four projects are, are remarkable and they're also indeed they're touching upon some of the key issues um, of our time. And starting with the plastic bags and then moving on to the uh, blue, blue uh, sequestration of, of, uh, or, or ocean and then on water, how to save waters and uh, at the end of the sustainable fashion, all of them are very important issues. Uh, I'm very much engaged with the plastic issue because uh, plastic is a menace and it's a very, very convenient and useful material, but it cannot end up in nature and, uh, and, uh, and, in, uh, and in oceans. It's killing a huge number of animals, it's bad for our health, and it's even an economic problem in many places because who, I mean, who are the tourists who want to go to a beach uh, full of plastic? Saving water is a key global issue in many dry areas. Water is a scarce resource, and it can even be a cause of wars and conflicts because there is too little water, so we need to use it a lot, lot more wisely. Uh, and of course, the oceans, I mean, 70% of, uh, of, of the planet is ocean. Uh, we need to take much better care of, of, of the ocean. And uh, blue carbon, um, meaning help meaning mangroves and in many other ways we can we can really really use it uh, to also to solve a global problem and fashion young people maybe particularly girls but also boys all over the world are very much into fashion at the moment 99 percent of all clothes we buy just thrown away that's of course new i mean our grandparents all over the planet they were repairing uh, over and over again to use and use again because they couldn't afford to buy new, but not many people in the global middle class can buy new and then we throw away rather than use again. And we should use more and we should use the raw materials um, uh, in a circular economy, meaning that if we make, have a prog product from, uh, from cotton or from, made from trees, uh, it should be handed in and then we should use raw materials again in a circular, circular economy. So I think all these four um, initiatives are brilliant and I will for sure add you to my Twitter profile, all of you. And uh, I'm ha happy to see if, if there are ways I can, I can support you, but because I cannot connect all of you with maybe all the people you want to, but please, um, if you have any suggestions, I'm happy to help. Thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Eric. Uh, Mano, over to you for the Q&A with the students. Yes, uh, so thank you for your advice, uh, Eric. Uh, we'll just open it up for some question answers that the, uh, and just uh, some students have some questions. So we'll just, uh, you know, I'll go uh, three students at a time. So it's uh, Isha, Harshit, and Riyadh Nagar. You had questions for Eric. Would you like to unmute yourself and you know, go in any particular order? Hi. 
So good evening, sir. My name is Ria Nagar, and um, the project I'm working on is called Project Sonder, and it basically aims to teach children in rural communities about basic disaster management um, through a set of curriculums. And after gaining this experience, after teaching these children, I aim to draft a white paper advocating for compulsory addition of disaster management in the rural school syllabus. So obviously this is a very important problem presently because um, as a consequence of climate change, we face an increase in the intensity and frequency of natural disasters. So um, I've heard that you've done work and have experience in this area. And I was wondering if there are any tips, guidelines or um, advice you could give me going further into my project based on your experience. Thank you. So Eric, um, uh, disaster management, and uh, there, I know that uh, United Nations Environmental Program and UNESCO came together and did some work on environmental education in school. So is there anything that, uh, that you would like to offer as an advice for uh, incorporating environmental education and especially on the work on disaster management in the curriculum? Okay, I thought you wanted to take three questions at a time. Uh, ha happy to respond to this. I mean, obviously, uh, disaster management is, is a key issue. We, we need to stop the global warming, uh, reduce it so that there are less crises to take care of. Uh, and we need to prepare for, uh, for crisis management. And I think what's very important to understand is that climate change, the effect on humans is basically through water, meaning that you get less water, which is drought, or you get more water, which is a flooding, or you get extreme weather like a cyclone or the monsoon being uh, more heavy. Uh, so you have water management issues. And of course, governments need to protect people better. And India, there is a lot of progress. I mean, last year, India had a cyclone in Odisha and it killed only 10 people. It was a huge cyclone. I mean, a few decades back, it would have killed tens of thousands of people. Now we kill 10. Why? Good weather forecast. So the people of Odisha knew exactly where the cyclone would hit. Uh, Chief Minister of Odisha prepared people uh, reaching out and informing uh, and prepared buses so people could go, go away from the hotspot. And of course, after the flooding and the cyclone, no, no one died from diseases or, or hunger or anything like that. So it was a well-prepared society which handled it. Still, of course, it, it's a disaster for people who may, uh, you, uh, may lose uh, property and uh, uh, so it, it's bad. So I think preparing people through school projects, to, through information, through media is very essential. Um, there are some UN uh, youth programs, uh, which you may, may be able to link up to if you connect uh, with the UN environment in Nairobi. But also I think there are lots of good examples from all over the planet. There is also a particular UN organization for, uh, for disaster management. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, Harshit and Isha, any one of you want to go first? Hello, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Hello, sir. I'm Isha Arun, and I'm studying in NPS Raj Rajajnagar, and I'm really passionate about the environment and fast, sustainable fashion. So my question to you would be, uh, recently, who do you think is mainly responsible for the uh, climate change crisis? A lot of people have now taken to social media blaming various industries and the government, like the fossil fuel industry, blaming them for causing so much greenhouse gases and pollution, whereas a lot of it is produced by the pollution, uh, by the population themselves. So while solving this crisis, which one should we keep in mind? Uh as I said initially, we need to do three things at the same time. We need to mobilize normal people, you and me and everyone else, uh, to change habits and to put pressure on political leaders. We need the political leaders. I mean, if in, India should change, of course, Prime Minister Modi must take the lead at the federal level and the state ministers in, say, the state of Karnataka need to lead uh, on the state. Uh, and business uh, need to change. Uh, that is moving from oil and coal into renewables that's happening very fast now and will happen much faster in the future. So we see a lot of people uh, stopping using uh, coal uh, and moving into solar and wind and other renewables and moving into electrical cars, uh, into electrical buses, electrical uh, rickshaws, 
um, you, you see a, a lot of changes and the, the, this we can much faster than people think because we are sometimes change is very very slow until it starts becoming very fast and now we are in the phase where it's becoming very very fast so i don't i'm not really interested in blaming someone i mean true the big oil and coal companies can be blamed and some very slow politicians who don't act can be blamed but it's much more about inspiring people in politics and business and at the grassroots to do more Thanks, Eric. I know you're you're an optimistic, and uh, I know you're looking at what can be done rather what has not been done. So I think that's where we need to have a forward-looking strategy towards climate crisis. In fact, um, you know, uh, one of our students he was working in the coastal areas of Andhra Pradesh. There's a big shrimp farming industry there, and uh, through a technology uh, innovation and a sensor and an app, he was able to reduce or save. Uh, half or in fact even greater than half fuel diesel cost because of the aerators. So they run aerators and of course that's that causes a lot of pollution. So I think technology could be used a lot and I think young people can take really that lead in using technology innovation to reduce uh, some of the uh, some of this pollution and some of the fossil fuels and stuff that is happening. And I think uh, I really was inspired with your uh, one of your comments that we need to make this as part of the economic discussion and you know how uh, climate crisis could be you know with electric cars and with solar panels I mean it's part of the economy and I think that's a long sustainable way to take action on crisis, uh, on climate and I think technology will play a big role and the young people can can really be in the forefront of it especially that they're always coming up with new technology innovation and the AI stuff that we'll hear from Sapkin Data is, is a big one. So great, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Ria. Harshit, are you there in case you want to ask? Otherwise, we'll have Shanshre and Risha. Yeah, sure. Hi, sir. Uh, so I just had a, a quick question. Uh, so how do you believe that uh, you know sustainable forms of energy, such as you know solar energy, uh, wind energy? How how do you believe that such forms of energy can be uh, uh, brought out to the common people in an affordable manner? How do you how do you feel that you know the prices can be lower? Uh, they are already affordable. Uh, solar en energy is now cheaper than coal everywhere in the world. Solar energy in India is the cheapest anywhere in the world. So it's just a matter of getting rid of conservatism. There are some conservative leaders in business and politics who don't understand the new world. Uh, but uh, there is no no reason any longer to in invest in coal because che solar is cheaper. So it's better for Mother Earth better for health and better for the economy at the same time. Uh, my wife just started leasing an electric vehicle here in Norway uh, and it's much cheaper uh, than the uh, former gasoline car, much cheaper. Okay. And the new technology, which will be, uh, as uh, we heard, when young people will make a lot of innovations, but also car companies or electrical uh, companies will make innovations. So in, in the next uh, few years, this will be a lot, lot cheaper. A new modern electric vehicle can move five, more than 500 kilometers for every charge. Uh, and the price for moving it is much lower than for gasoline or, okay. or diesel. Okay, okay, that's cool. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Shanshrey, Rishabh, are you there? Yes, sir. So, sir, my question would be, how has the pandemic affected the work done towards the SDGs in the last five years? And how can we um, overcome these setbacks due to the pandemic? The negative effect of the pandemic is basically that, unfortunately, some people will go back to poverty or people who have been moving up to the middle class may again be uh, in poverty because of the economic effects of the of, of the virus uh, when it comes to the environment uh, nearly all effects are, are in <laughs> indirectly positive um, just i mean if you look to the to the global stock exchanges over the summer uh, what has drastically uh, increased in value is renewable energy and what has been reduced in value is uh, oil service so you see 50% increase in the value of, of renewables and 50% decrease in the value of, of oil service. Uh, and also all over the world, people have experienced uh, the benefit of seeing nature. 
uh, in India and some parts of northern India. They could see the Himalayas for the first time in many, many, many years. I saw some photos from Punjab that had ne never seen the Himalayas because of all pollution. Now they can see pollution. And in many cities, uh, wildlife have come back. Uh, in, in, in Cape Town, in South Africa, penguins were walking through the streets. In uh, some European cities, you could even see bears in the streets, uh, uh, elephants in Thailand. And people, I think, want to, want to see this also in the future. So they will uh, step up um, uh, taking care of, uh, uh, of, of nature after the crisis. But for sure, the crisis has a negative economic impact on some and, of course, health impact also on others. So it's, it's a severe crisis. But I'm sure in, a, in, in five years, we will be much stronger than we were before the crisis. Yes, sir. Thank you. Great. Um, then Shanshre and Goar Goel, are you there? Do you want to ask this question? Uh, yes, sir. Hi. Yes, go ahead. Respected sir, um, I am a 16 year old high school student and a campaigner for sustainable living for almost three years now, focusing on xenotoplastics and sustainable menstruation. One disposable sanitary pad contains plastic equivalent, equivalent to five polythene bags. With almost 800 million women menstruating on a daily basis and relying on these disposable sanitary products, we can only imagine the heaps of uh, plastic and chemicals that are being added to the daily solid waste. My question to you, sir, as a global influencer, is there any strategy or policy being worked upon to steer the manufacturers or users of these disposable sanitary products towards a more usable and sustainable menstruation products? Yes, uh, God, this is a great question. And the truth is that you, you need to make the companies responsible. Uh, those who push the plastic into the market must also be responsible for solving the problem they are creating. This can be all, all the big uh, food and supermarket companies who are selling products, or it can be the plastic uh, producers uh, or both. Uh, and I think there is a global best practice, which is called extended producer responsibility, which means that if you are a plastic company or you are a food company selling something packed in plastic, you must also take responsibility for bringing it back which means that you will have to finance the, the solutions. Uh, and of course, the other solution is um, recycling. Some products can be prohibited. I mean, do, I mean we don't need really real straws, do we? You have to drink straight from the cup. And why why would, we, would we need a straw? Um, but an average American is using 600 straws a year. Let's, let's get rid of the straws. We don't need them. Uh, and there are others, I mean, in some, uh, some Hindu festivals in India, you see a huge number of balloons. Can, can't you find other ways of celebrating Shiva or, or Ganesh than using a balloon? I think it's, it's possible. And these balloons very often end up in, in lakes and, uh, and in the ocean. So some products you can uh, get rid of, some you can uh, change. I'm very happy that you brought up the issue of menstruation uh, products because I think that's a huge issue. Uh, the pro pro producer should be forced either to make something which do not encompass plastic, or if it's plastic within the product, they must be responsible for bringing it in. Because we need plastic for uh, uh, making sure that food is not destroyed uh, and that it can be lasting longer. And we need plastic for health issues. I mean, the time of the COVID-19, many masks have been using plastic. For sure, it's a useful material, but then it must be recycled into new plastic or into fuel. So we can, uh, it doesn't end up in nature. But thank you for bringing up you and uh, your colleague also earlier brought up the issue of menstruation. I think it's a big issue. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, there, there's a whole discussion around the circular economy now. And I think that's that's only going to gain a lot of importance. And I think all of you young leaders here, I think you should research on how you can contribute in the circular economy. I think that's going to be a big topic in the future uh, for anything that we are consuming and reusing. I think that we need to look at that. So let's look at, uh, probably we have time for one last question. Um, uh, thanks, Gohar. Uh, Adarsh, uh, you want to go next? Adarsh, are you there? I see your question. Uh, yes, sir. I'm here. Yeah, so my question is, like, good evening. My name is Adarsh. I started this project called Lighthouse along with two of my friends. 
Our project is based on tackling religious discrimination and increasing acceptance. We have connected with multiple schools and countries, uh, uh, schools in Hyderabad and countries. This included sessions with Pakistan, bringing people from India here, uh, India with people from Pakistan there. We had a general discussion, setting aside all our differences and received immense positive feedback. Since you have worked in Sri Lanka, it would be great if you could help us connect with them and explain your experience about bringing people together. Yeah, I think before connection, others, I, you know, um, Eric, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, they're enthusiastic to get connected. But I think uh, we would like to more hear from from you. You've been a peacekeeper, and you've done a lot of negotiations in uh, in countries like uh, uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and I was reading Sudan. Uh, what advice would you have for others? And esteem? they're working on a fascinating project where they're increasing young people from both sides, which is India and Pakistan to come together for creating a, you know, better future, better harmony and better, you know, and be more tolerant. So uh, any suggestion that you would have for from a peacekeeping role that you have done so wonderfully in your career? Just uh, first one question. You, you are from Indian Hyderabad because it's a bit confusing because that's one of the few names where there is one city, both in India and yeah. as well in Pakistan. That's great. That's India Hyderabad, yeah. India Hyderabad, yes. No, I think it's it's um, very, very useful that you are reaching out to people in Pakistan. Uh, we need to try to be, bring peace and, and understanding and reconciliation between well, because between Hindus and Muslims, but and, and because between India and Pakistan, that, that's absolutely critical. So please reach out and please try to find ways to respecting them. Um, looking for what, what's good also in, in Pakistan, because if we can create an atmosphere of peace, every, everyone will believe and um, they will benefit. There will be so much more trade, economic benefit. People could travel between the two countries in a much easier fashion. So I think uh, it's, it's great if you can uh, cooperate with, with, Pak with Pakistan. In my experience, I was involved for many years in the peace process in Sri Lanka, fortunately, uh, during the peace process, uh, tens of thousands of li lives were spared, but at the end, it ended up in a military solution where many, many people died uh, in Sri Lanka. I think the number one lesson you need to learn is that you need to compromise. If you insist that I will have everything as I want, uh, you come nowhere because the others will, will not accept. So you need to find ways where you help the others and they help you so that you can find something which is acceptable for everyone. I believe in Sri Lanka, the solution would have been acceptable to basically everyone and that was federalism. Uh, the Tamils and the Sinhalese could have worked together in Sri Lanka on federal basis. I mean, that's exactly what people are doing in India. If you're living in the state of like Hyderabad in the, <laughs> in the state of Telangana, uh, or in, or in Karnataka, you have a lot of devolved power. I mean, Dale is not deciding everything for you. You can speak um, Telugu uh, language in, uh, or Kannada language. You can approach your chief minister in your own language. Uh, there is a lo lot of power um, resting with the, with, with the states as to how to work. And that is what it should have been in Sri Lanka also. But uh, because of the, the lack of ability to compromise, uh, still Sri Lanka has not really resolved the Tamil uh, issue in Sri Lanka, uh, but in the future they will find find solutions. I'm 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 confident. But uh, the the key to peace is to understand the other, respect others, listen to them, not just talking yourself, and and find compromises with them. And if India and Pakistan can do that, uh, it will be very good for the world. Thank you so much. I think um, yeah, we we'll just end the questions. We have a lot of questions coming up. But I think uh, in the interest of time, we have 18 minutes left. Uh, I'll give it off to uh, Safin and let's talk more about the Climate Action Clubs, Eric, uh, that we want you to be participate uh, with us here. And of course, we want your, your support in launching that up. So open, uh, over to uh, Safin. Um, thank you, Manav. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? All right, so yeah, so we are here for the most interesting part, you know, I think most of the students are here for that again for the launch of the interesting one and one climate action clubs. And uh, in fact, thank you, Mr. Eric for joining us and it's really a privilege to have you uh, a noted environmentalist, somebody who cares so much about the environment to have here with us to launch actually the one and one climate action clubs and let me just share a brief overview of what the clubs are all about. 
so the news today you open up this is all you see you know issues caused by climate action and the united nations um, general assembly is on the 75th year general assembly right now and past 3 4 days i've been following the tweets and the only thing you know in in focus right now are the effects of climate action global warming the climate climate crisis uh, in fact the new movie uh, the film that united nations released the nations united again talks extensively about the effects of climate crisis on the different sdgs now i mean look at some of these right 90% of disasters are due to climate crisis uh, you know food and water security is harmed because of global warming and if we continue taking no action then some of the top tourist destinations some of our favorite cities like new york san francisco abu dhabi uh, rio de janeiro all of them are going to vanish and going to go underwater so it's high time we take action on this and while everyone's been talking about it, the united nations the global leaders everyone's been talking about it, you know trying to take action we idly require people to step up now again you know corona the covid-19 pandemic has shifted the focus completely on to um, mitigating the pandemic now and the effects uh, and and uh, the efforts put in towards the sdg 2030 um, goals in the last 5 years have been overshadowed and you know i'm sure many of you would have seen similar pictures like these uh, devastating and shocking where we are trying to get rid of plastic but at the same time a new menace uh, in terms of pp kits and masks are harming the environment and animals and birds alike while we are trying to uh, flatten the covid-19 curve there is another curve that we have suddenly forgotten it's the curve of climate change and that's something we all need to focus on collectively as as humanity and like uh, the un secretary general mr antonio guterres said the climate emergency is a race we are losing but it is a race we definitely can win you know and and adding on we are facing destruction from climate crisis there's no denying that and to build a sustainable and safe future we idly require the youth to step up youth because they have the idea the passion the energy and and that creativity that comes only with the youth and as we grow older you know that kind of goes off we start advocating and we kind of starting the back seat and move away from the action which is why we need the youth to take charge to save the world and uh, we at one on one we believe and i'm sure mr eric you will agree that climate action begins with the youth um and and like the united nations again you know looking at the united nations sustainable development goals the big focus is on youth stepping up youth being part of it to achieve the goals and you know a number of campaigns like hashtag youth 2030 generation unlimited all focusing on the youth to achieve the sdgs in the next 10 years uh, of the decade of action and we thought you know looking at all the projects that have been part of future leaders where you know over 600 students have been part of the program in the last 4 5 years and incredible projects coming out but india has the highest number of youth population in the world why not open this up to everyone and make sure that all youth across india have the opportunity to take climate action and also give them an opportunity to bring their ideas to reality and that's how we came up with this idea of climate action clubs which uh, places young people at the forefront of climate action um the idea here is to involve the schools you know there are lots of schools there are in fact you know la- hundreds of thousands hundred thousand schools in india alone so involving them in the complete uh, climate action and getting the youth involved is as a idea and uh, our vision as such is to have a pan india network of student hubs where students can actually come together learn about the climate crisis engage with each other like minded students and finally take action on the climate act crisis and a big vision in fact is to uh, activate 100000 climate action warriors in the next 6 months seems a large number but we are sure we should be able to do this with the support of all the schools and all the youth across india and what we are also focusing on is the use of new age technology like artificial intelligence to address climate crisis so everyone's been talking about ai and the power it has but unless the technology is used and put to good using ai for good it's 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 just a good to have technology nothing good you know technology has to help humanity solve some of the biggest crises and that's what we are trying to do through the clubs as well empowering students give them give them the new tools and technology so they can come up with creative solutions to address the different issues around a climate that we are facing uh, we have mainly identified three challenges carbon safety water safety and responsible consumption under which most of the climate crisis issues come in so carbon safety if you look at you know organic farming um, green energy sources like madam mentioned earlier one of the projects uh, was focused in in you know andhra pradesh looking at you know reducing the consumption of uh, 
fueled by the shrimp farmers and looking at protecting the biodiversity. And thanks to this amazing project, these students have been you know, picked up by some top universities to take the project forward. So we want to make sure that students work on these kind of projects and also be able to take it forward uh, in their career as well, rather than just as a one-off project. Um, and water safety, of course, you know, like one of the projects that you saw around clean water, sanitation and conservation, responsible consumption, again, big topics, sustainable menstruation, plastic pollution, uh, protecting the oceans, waste management, responsible fashion, etc. So um, we'll begin with these three particular challenges where the schools and students will participate in. And of course, you know, as we see the, the innovations coming and in, we'll expand to more. Um, by being part of these kind of clubs, uh, the Climate Action Club students have a number of opportunities for them. Of course, they are part of a huge community of like-minded students, climate action warriors, as we call them, who want to make the world a better place and build a better future for themselves. Um, we are looking at providing you know, great uh, leadership opportunities for them. We are also looking at uh, giving some of the students doing some incredible work and opportunity to present their work at the United Nations, uh, at the 101B summits at the UN and uh, at, across our partner networks. A lot of activities for them, number of key learning resources, which we have curated from across, uh, across the internet and from across the different partners. And of course, a lot of rewards and recognition, the fun element coming for them, you know, to make this interesting. So all in all, a fun-filled club where all of them come together for the sole purpose, purpose of building a better future and protecting our planet. So I invite all the students as well as, uh, you know, all the other guests who have joined us today to join us in our mission to activate 100,000 climate action warriors. And uh, Mr. Eric and uh, Manav, in your presence, it would be a great honor uh, for me to, in fact, you know, go ahead and officially launch this Climate Action Club of 101B. Um, the website is, in fact, ready. And uh, though we did have a soft testing going on, today is when we'll be officially launching. And I'll just go ahead and, uh, you know, in your presence, go ahead and click launch. And our website should be opening now. Yes. So um, I hope you're able to see my screen. So this <laughs> Yes, <laughs> jump rolls. You don't know what's your clap. You can unmute and give a clap. That should be good. So this is our yeah, Climate Action Club website and all the schools and students can join us here and uh, looking forward to <laughs> Oh, is it? Sorry, one second. Let me just share that again. Yeah, maybe you need to share the screen. One second, yes. Here, okay. So yes, so this is the Climate Action Club's website. And it's open for all schools and students to register from today. And uh, it's, it's a great honor, Mr. Eric, to have you for the launch and wonderful to kick off this new initiative of 101B. So yes, all the students, you guys can, of course, you know, enroll your schools and be part of this program and uh, look forward to some incredible impact in the upcoming months. And uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, uh, and one of the things that uh... Eric, I uh, would like to share is some of these students who have already done good work will be part of this Climate Action Club and they would be forming teams with about 200 schools. So we are, we have, we are growing our partnership with our 200 schools. One of the biggest challenges all these young leaders are facing is how do they scale up their initiative? Uh, like if there's work on fast fashion or water or carbon, it needs to be taken up by many young people and since the students that you saw today are kind of role models and have taken a lead. We want all the other schools to join them kind of in, a, in this relay race and take some of their projects and implement that in their community. And a lot of teachers would be joining this initiative. We're starting a teacher program as well on this where teachers could be part of it. And possibly we also have a teacher award for climate action who are mobilizing their students and taking this forward. So next week uh, I have a meeting uh, with uh, with, uh, with the central regulatory body of India. Uh, they have 21,000 schools and we're discussing opportunities on how we can really take climate action clubs and make this part of the main, main conversation in, in schools so that many schools could be part of it and more than that, teachers could lead this initiative uh, with their students. Uh, so thank you for joining us on this. I would like to just listen to any comments that you have um, uh, as we you know, wrap up the session in the next few minutes. No, just uh, to congratulate you with this uh, great initiative. I uh, was again, I was so inspired by these four examples of what can be done, but of course there are any number of other initiatives which young people in India can make. So <clears throat> please come to me if you do uh, remarkable uh, 
amazing things inform me and I will do my best to use my network to reach out and, and bring this to the attention of, of others as well, because that's how we uh, build upon success. If you see something doing something right, uh, tell others and they will do, uh, do even more of it. So again, th thanks so much and um, I'm really excited with this. Yes, and, uh, um, and thank you for your kind words. In fact, uh, what we are also having is uh, University of California, Berkeley, they are joining us on the AI projects because technology and innovation and young people are a key driver uh, for any action that happens in AI. And responsible AI is a big topic at the College of Engineering at Berkeley. And uh, we would be sort of uh, partnering with them on uh, having some of these innovations, which are also tech led, uh, you know, and how they can be scaled up using this kind of network of schools. And I know Scandinavian countries uh, uh, have been at the forefront of technology. So if there are any young leaders or um, young youth leaders in Norway who would like to partner with these schools, with these young people to take their innovations forward and implement it, in India, we would be happy to offer that uh, that partnership as well of all these schools to youth leaders in Norway, and they could be joining hands with youth leaders of India to create a better world. Great. Great. So thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, all students, for joining us. Uh, thank and you. And before so much. we leave, Manav, you know, I, I request all the students, everyone, to kindly turn on your cameras. You know, it's good to see all oh, your faces. <laughs> Yes, and again, I can quickly take a group picture, you know, our new virtual group pictures. Yes, the cameras are coming on. Yes, give me a moment. I'm clicking for everyone. There are a lot of students here. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, yeah, I got a couple of good pictures. Okay, thank you so much again, and let's give a big round of applause for Mr. Alex Holman to join for joining us. Thank you so much, and uh, have the good rest of your evening, and uh, and good night, all of us in India. Thank you for the session, Sapin. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Bye bye.